And I promise to stop there and just show you that this is going to be a relaxed and fun. Now hold it, don't, don't go too far here. I told you I'm stopping at the tie. A couple of other housekeeping notes. I'd like to welcome our friends from afar who are seeing this presentation live streamed. And I'd like to thank our remote moderators up here who will be fielding their, their tweets and their texts and their questions later on in the program. We really appreciate their participation. And that means that this session is going to be seen around the world this afternoon. I'd like to encourage everybody in here to tweet anything they'd like about the session and to post on Facebook, take pictures. Keep your cell phones quiet, but on, so that you can take pictures and post. Um, I have three things I'd just like to mention to you about my own experiences with youth and social networking. And the first is what I call the death of email. So my nephew Derek is a lazy young man. I email him all the time. He lives in Washington, D.C., very close to me, and yet, whenever I email him or try to phone him, he never responds. And what I discovered is that he actually doesn't use email. And he doesn't use the telephone. He uses Facebook. And if I want to know what he's doing, I can find out by going to his Facebook site and watching his posts. Who here is familiar with Foursquare? If I want to find out where my nephew Derek is, I just have to go to Foursquare and see where he has logged in in the last five or ten minutes, and certainly that's where he'll be. So if I want to track my favorite nephew, I can't use email, I can't use the telephone, I have to use social media. And it seemed to me that this was actually a very good way to organize because I am one of those people who gets so many emails I can't keep track. So for me, the idea of a future without email and relying on social media might just be a good thing. The second thing I'd like to talk about is the instantaneous news bureau. So I was at dinner in Philadelphia in the United States. And I was with a number of colleagues, one of whom sits at the very end of the table over here. And as we were sitting and eating dinner, all of a sudden, his phone starts to go off. And it's not a telephone call. And he picks it up and looks at it, and his eyes get wide. And then his friend sitting right next to him, his phone starts to go off. And his eyes get wide. And what happened is that their friends had posted on Facebook the death of Steve Jobs. When they told me at dinner, I went right away onto my phone and I went, OK, CNN, Google News, Yahoo News, all the news sources. There was nothing, nothing at all about the death of Steve Jobs. And yet, we knew about it 20 minutes before any news bureau ever got it out on the airways because of the social networking of these young people. It's really remarkable what's happening. Finally, um, I'd like to talk about the cauldron of community. Um, if anybody has read Clay Shirky's book, Here Comes Everyone, which is a phenomenal book, and if you're interested in the power of social networking and the creation of community globally, I urge you all to read it. He talks about a group of fans of a music group that joined a site around the world. And at what point, a few of these people who were fans of this music group mentioned to each other on the site that they were interested in promoting education in a country in Africa. And pretty soon, this, two, these two people, who are fans of this music group, decided to get the word out through that same group. And before long, they had created a group of over 300 people around the world who donated to build a school in this country in Africa. And once the school was built, the community disappeared. It was a remarkable thing. And that story has stuck with me. And it, to me, it shows the power of social media to create communities and also let them die a natural death, if that's what they're to do. Special purpose communities that can come up and can arise from everybody and anybody across the planet. What a remarkable thing we have today. 
So, with that and my own experience and thinking, even though I may not be a young person, I am a young at heart person, and I really treasure this opportunity to put together this panel um, and this moderator. This moderator, whom I'm going to introduce right now, his name is Reggie Henry, and he is, he is a friend. He is also the Chief Technology Officer of the American Society of Association Executives, and in that capacity, he speaks around the world on issues of technology, how to use technology in various environments. He consults to organizations, social organizations around the world, so I'm going to let him stand up and do his thing, my good friend, Mr. Reggie Henry. Reggie. reminds me to turn on my microphone here. I started to think about what this is really all about. And I think we're really privileged um, to be in the midst of what we're in right now. Because what we're in right now is that the world is fundamentally changing the way in which it communicates. Right now, that's where we are right now. I'll, I'll tell a couple of stories that, that both kind of shocked me to my roots, um, but also gave me hope about what we might um, be looking at in the future. First story, and Ted mentioned this already, I was speaking not too long ago to a group of students at the University of Maryland uh, near Washington, D.C., where I live. And so in the middle of that conversation, one of the students raised their hands and said, we'd love to have a copy of the PowerPoint that you're doing. And I said, that's fine. After the session, everybody come up and give me a business card or write your name and email down, and I'll get it to you. And half of them looked at me like I was speaking some foreign language. And I said, well, what's the problem? And one young lady raised her hand. She said, Mr. Henry, I'm not sure how old you are, but most of us don't have email addresses. And I thought to myself what that meant. And I didn't think about it just from a communicating to them point of view, because I said, well, how do you expect me to get to them, get it to you? And they said, well, you have to write it on our walls. And I thought about what that meant. So anybody um, who, and, and then the, the, the third thing they said was, and we have to give you permission to write on our walls. We have to friend you at some kind of way. So how many of you here do marketing of some type? Okay. And I don't know about you, but, but our way of marketing has kind of been spray and pray. Everybody that you got an email address for gets the marketing, um, and you hope someone bites. Think about what it would mean to have to have somebody's permission to market to them, because that's the world we're all going to be in pretty soon. That you have to have a value proposition so strong um, that people are willing to be friends with you to allow them to market to you. It's a different world than what we live in. This second story is about a niece I have. My niece's name um, is Dania, um, lovely young lady right now. Okay. Wasn't always a lovely young lady, but lovely, lovely young lady right now. Okay. And she's got a brother, and her brother is three years younger than she is. And not too long ago, probably four years ago, um, her brother was having a, his annual birthday party. And I noticed Dania sitting off in the corner looking real sullen. And I said, Dania, what can possibly be the matter? Your brother's having his birthday. It's usually a happy time. And uh, she was about 14 then. So she looked me square in my eyes. She said, Uncle Reggio, I'm being cheated out of life. And I'm like, Wait, whoa, whoa. I got a 14-year-old young lady who's telling me she's being cheated out of life. So I said, so what's that all about? Well, Dania happens to be born on December the 26th. It's the day after Christmas. And she said, every year I'm getting cheated out of my birthday or I'm getting cheated out of Christmas, and I don't like it one bit. <laughs> and so I did what good uncles do. I promised her that until she became 19, or until I got uh, too far along that I couldn't pay for it anymore, that I would take her out and we'd buy a birthday present um, or a Christmas present. Okay. That next year, we went to buy the present. So I get over to Dania's house, and I said, Dania, what do you want for your birthday? What do we go get this year? And she says, I have no idea. 
And I'm thinking the worst. I'm now she's a 16-year-old. I'm getting ready to take her to the mall with an unlimited budget. Okay? Scary times for me. But she said, hold on for one minute. She got onto her social network, and she said, I'm going out to the mall with Uncle Reggio. I have no idea what I want. And so I figured we'd be there five or 10 minutes. Well, it was two minutes, and things started pouring in. And I looked at where they were pouring in from, and two messages came from South America. And one message came from Australia. And then one message came from the Near East in Egypt. And one message came from Iraq. And I was dumbfounded, 16-year-old young lady. And I said, who were these people? And she said, these people are my friends. And I said, how often do you talk to these people? She said, I talk to them at least once or twice a week. And I thought to back when I was 16 or 17 and who my circle of friends were. Um, quite the different experience. And so I asked one more question. I said, what do you talk about? You've got somebody in Iraq. You've got somebody in South America. You've got somebody in Australia. She said, oh, normal things. And I said, normal things like what? She said, well, just the other day, the young lady in Iraq was telling us how she couldn't get to school because there was some insurgency going on in her neighborhood, and she heard gunfire all morning. And I said, she's 14, 15 years old with a bunch of other 14, 15 years olds in a community. They've never met each other face to face, and they're having that level of intimate conversation. And, and, and it both scared me to death, but then made me realize what responsibility we all have in this world with this medium that we call the internet and, and what we're leaving behind as a legacy um, for the folks following us. So with that kind of thought in mind, that's what this is really all about. And, and for all of you who I'm looking at who are not quite as old as Ted and myself, um, you are what this is all about in the way you communicate, in the way you live. So this, this session, um, for the most part, um, will, will be about that. Um, so we'll explore the complicated, and it really is a complicated role that social media plays in society right now. We've got some wonderful panelists who I'm getting ready to introduce to you right now. But we're going to ponder questions like, in what ways is social media changing the very essence of human interaction? The very essence of human interaction. And how is social networking powering social and political change um, in countries um, as, that, as the Arab Spring showed us, for example? So I'm going to take this time right now to introduce my colleagues one by one. Each one of them will then um, share with us their experiences and, and how the internet has changed their lives and what's going on in their individual countries. Okay? So let me get through that introduction one by one. Um, and then Do Dr. Turex is going to give us kind of some, some, out, uh, some, some statistics about what's going on all around. So in fact, why don't we start with you, Dr. Turek, and have you do that right now. But before I do that, um, just to tell you a little bit about Dr. Kamel. Dr. Kamel is considered the father of the internet in Egypt and is an expert on the global internet community. He served as a member of the Internet Society Board of Trustee, Trustees and is the vice president for chapters from 1999 to 2002. He is a founding member and a previous board member of AFRINIC, where he's acted as the chairman of the Executive Bureau of the Arab, Arab Telecommunications and Information Council of Ministers from 2004 to 2008. In recognition of his leadership in the ICT sector, the South African Ministry of Communications named him in 2005 the top minister in Africa with an ICT portfolio. So join me um, in welcoming Dr. Kamel. for this introduction and please allow me to say without doctor I'm just Tarek so during the conversation let's use just the first name and without official titles good afternoon everybody I'm glad to be invited by ISOC to this event about so use and social networking and when I thought um, what am I going to be starting with the, this panel I uh, uh, my opinion was to start with giving an overview a little bit over the last uh, 10 to 15 years the evolution of the internet from a technical point of view that really enabled us today to talk about social networks. And then I will touch on the Arab Spring, as Reggie has mentioned, with a specific example from Egypt, what has happened in 2011, very specifically in the Arab region, how the internet mobilized the reform in the Arab region and the Arab Spring 
and how youth utilize this tool really uh, to start a change in our part of the world. It's not only about Egypt, it's Tunisia as well and other parts of the Arab world. But as I said, I will be focusing on, um, on Egypt. If we look backwards, Within the last 10 to 15 years, there have been definitely uh, very uh, useful contributions this morning from uh, many panelists who contributed to the development and in invention of the Internet. But I realize that there are two basic consumer shifts has happened. The first one is moving from fixed to mobile on a wider scale. And we take it for granted today that everybody is using mobile communication uh, for uh, Internet. This was not the case five to ten years ago, so this is definitely one of the major shifts. The overall mobile traffic is becoming by far more than uh, the fixed traffic. The second thing are real-time applications, voice and video. And again, we take this for granted, but uh, ten years ago this was not for granted. In many parts of the world we did not have the bandwidth and we did not have the throughput and we did not have the performance really to allow real-time communication on a wider scale. It was only text-based, but we have done this investment in our part of the world and changed definitely the infrastructure and upgraded the infrastructure. On a regulatory part, we see that the product has changed. The product has changed in the telecommunication network from voice-based to connectivity. The service is connectivity. And as it has been mentioned, it is completely different than the old model. The old model also uh, included the metric as a minute. Now it's not anymore the minute. It's bandwidth and throughput. And in the old telecommunication model, the distance and duration were important. The distance and duration are meaningless today in our Internet. All this has triggered change, tri change in the utilization of the Internet and specifically the introduction of social networks on a wider scale, not only in our part of the world, but globally. This has shifted using the Internet on a wider scale. And in addition to that, another major point of change came, which is user-generated content. We used to be have in the old model, uh, just the con at least in our part of the world, that the user is a recipient from one bigger organization, whether it's a government or a company or whatever. They are creating the content and disseminating the content, and the platform is used for content preservation and dissemination. But now user-generated content is de facto, and we take it as a de facto, but this was not the case in the past. Again, but this has changed the world, that user-generated content is, be is becoming a very uh, important factor in the overall utilization of the network. Today's internet, as we heard this morning, has 2.3 billion users worldwide, more than 3 billion IP addresses, IPv4 addresses. We have 6 billion mobile users worldwide with a global 85% penetration. The fixed number of phone users is 1.3 billion, and that's the only thing that's not increasing in telecommunication in number, but it is decreasing, and they are becoming less and less. The broadband fixed uh, users are around 600 million worldwide, and the broadband mobile users have exceeded the billion, 1.2 billion, and are expected to reach 3.8 billion by the year 2015, one of the highest growth rates in the world in information technology when it comes to mobile internet communication, and it is primarily because of the youth utilization and because of the social, of the social networks uh, worldwide. I tried to find out some statistics on the internet, what happens in one minute of internet and social networking. And I found out that we have six million Facebook pages viewed in one internet minute. And we have 20 million Flickr photos being viewed in one internet minute. And we have around 1.3 million video clips seen on YouTube and witnessed on YouTube. And we still have 250 million emails sent. Although Todd has mentioned that many youngsters do not use email, but we still we see uh, 240 or 250 emails per minute sent on each internet minute today globally worldwide. So the platform has changed, the content has changed, and the utilization of the internet, uh, if the internet has changed. What has happened in our part of the world? In our part of the world, we were definitely part of the evolution since the early 90s. And the uh, Africa and the Arab world was committed to develop its infrastructure and to invest in infrastructure development as well. It happened in Egypt, it happened in Tunisia, it happened in the Gulf state, and it happened in many African countries as well. Egypt was committed to invest in infrastructure development on a wider scale. Today we have 30 million internet traffic uh, uh, countrywide, around 30% uh, uh, penetration. Just to give you an idea, that number in the year 1999 was just around 1 million users. So it's something that have been 
magnified by a, a factor of 30 in 10 years, in one decade. This is definitely a big evolution. Our country enjoys as well today traffic 180 gigabit per second international traffic. Just to give you an idea, in the mid-90s, we had one single 64 kilobit per second link that was connected Egypt for many years with the rest of the world. So many people really invested in the development of this infrastructure and the, uh, uh, and the evolution of this infrastructure. Our overall mobile penetration has exceeded 100% around 90 million today mobile users, while the population is 85 million. And the broadband penetration has also uh, been exceeding 10 million uh, today via mobile broadband as well as fixed broadband on a wider scale. So also in our part of the world, the platform has changed. And this change in platform has triggered a political reform and a political change. We have been witnessing it in, at the end of the year 2010 and at the beginning of year 2011 with the uprise in Egypt that started in Tunisia before Egypt in mid-January and, uh, and then Egypt. The youth have utilized the internet on a wider scale to communicate to each other, to coordinate their steps, to mobilize, to, to mobilize the society, to disseminate information, and to share knowledge with themselves but with the rest of the world about what's going on in our country in, in, in that time. And CNN and the TV channels, uh, Al Jazeera and others, have not been the only source of information as it used to be in the country and in the region. But a new media, social media, really has created a new platform for communication for this use, asking for political reform and pushing for political, uh, uh, for political reform in our country that has triggered definitely the overall reform. But as I said, it did not only happen in Egypt. It happened in Tunisia as well, and it happened in Sudan, and it happened in other parts of the Arab world as well, in Yemen and in Libya and now in Syria and in other parts of the African countries as well. Facebook has been the primary uh, source of, uh, of change uh, using social media, but uh, uh, Twitter as well as a microblogging tool that has been utilized. And you have been witnessing in Egypt uh, during that period in three months 30% growth in the number of Facebook users. They have jumped from the late two, uh, 2010, 4.5 million uh, Facebook users in our country, and at the end of 2011 they were around 10 million Facebook users in our country. Again, a vast growth that have been taking place. The Twitter traffic has been grown in the Arab region by 65% in, uh, in, in 2011 as a tool for change and as a tool really for, uh, for the utilization. And when it comes to the Facebook users worldwide, the Arab world has 45 million Facebook users worldwide. If we map this to the overall Facebook population that is estimated around 1 billion, this is around 5%. And this is for the first time the healthy average of the Arab population towards the overall population of the world. Because the Arab population is around 5% of the overall global population. 350 million Arab uh, inhabitants or Arab speaking uh, people worldwide out of 7 billion uh, 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 world uh, inhabitants. So this is the healthy 5%. For the first time in, our, in, in life, we have just the average number, the healthy number, the normalized number that we should have in the overall global uh, community as the Arab world in, uh, in Facebook. And this was because of the youth, because of the youngster society that really decided to utilize the internet for change. And 70% uh, of the Facebook uh, users in the Arab world are between the age bracket of 15 to 29. And everything that is above 29 is considered definitely uh, from a, a different age bracket in their point of view. But I would also have to say that it, uh, Facebook and, uh, and Twitter are being utilized worldwide by 60% by, by women. In our part of the world, around 40% of women are utilizing Facebook and, uh, and, and Twitter. And this is an achievement if we consider that it is a conservative region uh, that, is, um, that is there. So definitely, as I have said, this tool has been utilized for change. They are looking forward now for the, for the further elections that will come, that will be utilized using, uh, uh, using social media. If you ask people today, uh, how would you uh, select a president that is not uh, uh, would you select a president that is not visible on Facebook and Twitter and social media? And the answer has been 
in one of the surveys, 70% in Egypt, 71% in Egypt said we wouldn't select a president who does not utilize social media uh, for uh, uh, his uh, elections, and 47% in uh, Tunisia have been doing the same. 90%, as I said, during the uprise in Tunisia and in Egypt have been utilized social media as their primary way of communication with the rest of the world to coordinate uh, the, uh, the efforts. I can't be talking about that without saying a final statement about what happened in our country concerning the internet cut because many people have asked about that in January 2011. I have been working for an affordable and open internet with many colleagues over the last 20 years in Egypt. Affordable, open, secure and uh, internet and free internet and neutral internet. And unfortunately, during uh, uh, the uprise of 2011, the security agencies have insisted on cutting the uh, internet traffic because they thought that this will help them to control the uprise. Again, unfortunately, the law allows that. The Telecommunication Act, they are looking now and changing the Telecommunication Act, allows the security agencies to uh, do that with the ISP when from their point of view they see a risk uh, to the overall uh, situation. I tried to prevent that as much as I could, but I was not able to do it. But at least from my point of view, I tried to restore the services as fast as I could because uh, this cut has been conflicting with my tenure and my career 20 years in open and free internet and affordable internet for the uh, Egyptian community. But I have learned the lesson, the lesson as well that an open and free internet in our part of the world needs an enlightened, co enlightened community, enlightened community also on the political decision-making level, which does not always exist. I lived the polarization between the public will to utilize the internet really for political reform, the legitimate public will for uh, political reform, and the will of the security agencies at that time to control the uprise, uh, uh, and unfortunately they, uh, they couldn't. But anyhow, also the infrastructure, the positive impact of the infrastructure in Egypt and its development over the 20 years and in the region have, uh, have brought the reform process and have made me more and more willing with many colleagues to continue to work for an affordable and open and free and stable internet on a global level. Thank you very much again for inviting me and I hope to have put some ground for a further discussion on social media and the Arab world and the Arab Spring. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And we'll, I, I've written down three or four questions. When we get to the Q&A uh, part of that, I certainly would like to ask you those. Um, but what stands out for me, and I hope everybody heard it as part of the message, um, is the internet is, is often where, uh, referred to as a disruptive technology. Uh, and I'm one of those people who think that disruption is a good thing. Um, but it's a disruptive technology. And you think about um, the way that in, in, the, in the Arab Spring, um, that technology um, had a lot to do with, with the, the collaborative efforts of young people to, to kind of move things in society, not just move things in their own circles, but to move things in society and then to move things in the world. So um, just keep those in mind as we're going. Um, we're also honored to have Slim Amamu here with us. And Slim is the uh, Chief Technology Officer at Elixis. And Slim is a computer programmer, entrepreneur, and blogger. Um, he co-founded the web agency Alpha Studios in 1999 and Elixis in 2008 as a web services company for enterprises. His writings focus on the modalities and mechanisms for the emergence of the new global society of the internet. He is also known for his positions against censorship and intellectual property and fights for the neutrality of the internet. In 2010, Slim was arrested for organizing a street protest against internet censorship and then again in 2011 during the Tunisian Revolution on the background of anonymous attacks. He was appointed Secretary of State for Youth and Sports in the new Tunisian interim government three days after getting out of jail. <laughs> he resigned after the return of internet censorship. So Slim will be uh, certainly um, happy and honored to hear your story. I wanted to talk a little bit about what happened, actually, maybe most of you don't know what was the role of social networks during the revolution. Uh, you have to know that uh, the amount of censorship that was in Tunisia was um, com comparable with what's happening in China. Uh, 
in the internet and especially in uh, classical medias. When um, uh, people started um, protesting in Sidi Bouzid, a small town in Tunisia, uh, no uh, classical media talked about it. No TV, no uh, radio, no uh, newspapers. So we took on ourselves to report on what was happening uh, uh, in Sidi Bouzid uh, using different uh, strategies and tactics because like in Egypt, they cut also internet from the town of Sidi Bouzid at some moment. Uh, uh, and we reported on what was happening there, the riots, the fighting with, with the police, the people that uh, get killed, uh, etc. And that got um, a snowball effect because uh, uh, we got the videos out of Sidi Bouzid and uh, people started pro protesting in different other towns in uh, support of Sidi Bouzid. And not only, and that's important, in different towns in Tunisia. For example, one of the first uh, cities that protested in support of Sidi Bouzid was Cairo, even before Tunis, the capital. Uh, and we had support from all over the world. Uh, so uh, what happened is, uh, it is commonly called the network effect, but in, in reality, it's like a social network effect. Uh, it was on Facebook, on Twitter, and uh, this snowball uh, got more and more huge, and soon the, the whole country was protesting. Uh, but in the same time, and that was very interesting, uh, that built like, uh, uh, a collective consciousness. We were constantly synchronized, people all over the world, uh, in Tunisia, uh, in France, in Egypt, were constantly on the internet, uh, keep, keeping up with the news and uh, organizing different things in different parts. When I got arrested, I got huge support from all over the world. Uh, and for example, the idea, because when we protested first, uh, uh, it was about social demands. Work, uh, correct living, etc. Then it evolved because of this collective mind, what we call the hive, the hive mind. Uh, in one idea, we have to take down the regime. And nobody got this idea first. It's everybody. This slogan uh, we had in, during the revolution, which is Ben Ali Degash, Ben Ali, which was the dictator, uh, everybody is asking who got this idea. Actually, nobody and everybody got this idea at the same time. And everybody got synchronized during the night from January 13 to the, the January 14. You got the whole Tunisian internet, the whole ne social networks, everybody got uh, this slogan on their uh, accounts. So that's uh, important because when we succeeded in this revolution, we proved that social networks are not just another software. Uh, social networks is a bigger thing. This thing can do revolutions anywhere in the world. Uh, this thing is very, very powerful. So uh, it can't be something that is controlled by uh, companies, foreign companies for, for most of the world. Social networks should be basic infrastructure of the internet, and we proved it in, the, in Tunisia. I began thinking about this fact in like 2010, uh, it was mainly about uh, overcoming censorship because uh, internet censorship was also a very big issue, but we overcame it during the revolution because we were used to it, we had the technology, we knew all the, 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 the different technology to overcome it. But we, we constantly made evolve the technology, uh, the, uh, circumvention technologies, censorship circumvention technology. So I was thinking about what we could do. 
And this idea of, um, you know, some content was censored over the internet. And you could have it, and in Tunisia, uh, we didn't have that issue of uh, um, anonymity about the content because uh, we're not like China. Access, simply accessing, and even in China it's possible, because simply accessing some kind of content doesn't make you a target, really. Uh, the problem is the, the, the content is technically censored. So I was thinking about this issue and uh, the fact that we could have any type of contact from friends all around the world. Uh, the only problem uh, we should have is how to ensure that content which is unavailable in Tunisia, but available, say, in Switzerland, is the right contact. So you have to build uh, a network of trust. And I noticed that social networks are actually about trust about networks of, there are in reality network of trust and very, very strong trust because it's a trust based on history. The other kind of trust we could have is trust based on delegation of authority and delegation of authority needs uh, a third part. So it's not, it's not as fault tolerant as history. So I began thinking about it. And then this year there was this censorship of mega upload. It was an international censorship of a website. Uh, and this got the ideas together. So uh, now uh, I have mainly uh, the, the, all the elements uh, of what we, we need for the internet, for the future internet. We need a social, networks, uh, a social network that is completely distributed and we need a solution for the centralization of uh, the domain name system. Those together, those things together would make a something new which could be called a social DNS. Because if you think about it, domain name system is about identity too, like social networks. No, the main names are identities. So we could build this technology, which is at the same time a DNS system and at the same time a social networks on which we could build trust and in, on which we could build be, because, you know, trust is the foundation of societies, on which we could build future societies and on which we could give by which we could give the power to the people again. And this is what I'm working on right now. And uh, I, once I get the things uh, done, the running code, I probably uh, publish standards at the IETF, so hence the role of Isaac. So now I'm doing a little bit of propaganda for my project <laughs> in case something goes wrong with the IETF in the future. So that's the point. Uh, I think that uh, that's my uh, argument. Social networks are, uh, should be uh, uh, a basic infrastructure of the internet because it makes revolution. So maybe we should discuss these issues later. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> this, this theme of disruption, of, of evolution, of of breaking the continuity of things um, you'll hear come out as, as we work through this, this session here. So um, be thinking about that as we go along here. Next, I have Aminata C. She's the president of the, the Senegalese Next Generation team, um, which, is now, which is an innovative program of the Internet Society's Senegal chapter. She has led that team since 2009, which brings together a group of young people to advocate for the use of the Internet and IT solutions by fellow Senegalese young and youth and students. As internet specialist, she applied for and attended the ICON uh, 43 meeting as, as ICON fellow for Africa. She is currently manager of the of information and communication section at the university. I'm gonna ask her to pronounce the name of the university because I can't. Um, and she was formerly the head of the multimedia center at the Polytechnic School in Dakar. So welcome.
Thank you, Henri, for this presentation. Uh, uh, I will speak in, uh, in French. Excuse me. <laughs> En fait, il s'agit de l'université Cher Anta Diop de Dakar. C'est la première université du Sénégal. Donc, je travaille là-bas dans la division information et communication. Déjà, je remercie euh, l'ISOC de m'avoir convié à ce panel. Moi, en ce qui me concerne, je vais essayer de vous parler un peu de l'expérience qu'on a eue au Sénégal avec les réseaux sociaux. Déjà, il faut savoir que nous avons plus de 700 000 Sénégalais inscrits sur les réseaux sociaux et ils sont en majorité des, des jeunes. Et ces jeunes Sénégalais ont su, en fait, essayer de remodeler les réseaux sociaux et de le personnaliser pour le Sénégal. C'est-à-dire, tout simplement, quand on parle de Twitter, eux, ils disent pas Twitter, mais ils disent Québétou. Québétou, c'est quoi C'est tout simplement Twitter dans notre langue nationale, le le Wolof. Ils ont aussi mis en place une plateforme qu'on appelle SN2 Twitter qui permet tout simplement à partir de, du mobile d'envoyer de, des tweets et de faire le link avec notre, notre compte Twitter. Mais l'expérience qui est le plus important ici, c'est une expérience qui s'est passée pendant les dernières élections au, au Sénégal. Je parle tout simplement de l'élection présidentielle. Je pense que tout le monde ici un peu, connaît un peu l'histoire qu'il y a eu derrière cette élection présidentielle. Qui n'en a pas entendu parler Tout le monde. Donc, l'utilisation des réseaux euh, sociaux, principalement de Facebook et de Twitter, ont permis aux jeunes Sénégalais de jouer un rôle très important pendant la, euh, la période électorale. Qu'est-ce qui s'est passé réellement En effet... Euh, tous les acteurs euh, politiques ou de la société civile euh, faisaient tout pour, qu y, pour que les élections soient, se passent d'une manière très transparente. Donc les jeunes sont dit spécialement les blogueurs, les jeunes sénégalais de la blogosphère, se disent « Ok, nous, nous voulons la démocratie, nous voulons la transparence ». Donc ils font un appel pour avoir des e-observateurs du processus électoral en utilisant les réseaux sociaux, Twitter et et Facebook. C'est ainsi qu'on a assisté à la naissance d'une plateforme qu'on appelle Sunu 2012, avec euh, le hashtag Sunu 2012, Sunu, S-U-N-U 2012, qui est un fil d'information spécialisé sur les élections. C'est-à-dire que chaque fois qu'un jeune Sénégalais voulait envoyer une information concernant euh, les élections présidentielles, ils utilisaient le hashtag Sunu 2012. Et bien entendu, derrière, ils utilisaient aussi le hashtag Québétou. Pourquoi Parce que tous les blogueurs sénégalais, tous les jeunes sénégalais qui utilisent Twitter, en fait, doivent automatiquement mettre le hashtag Québétou pour dire « Ok, ça, ce sont les tweets, en fait, provenant du Sénégal ». Ça nous permet de faire la différence entre les tweets nationaux et les tweets euh, étrangers. Donc, on s'est inscrit dans une, dans une logique qui va permettre aux citoyens sénégalais de pouvoir faire un choix lors des échéances électorales et de, et de permettre à tout un chacun, tout citoyen sénégalais, de se positionner comme étant un vrai sentinelle de la, de la démocratie et de veiller aussi à, au respect de la transparence et du processus électoral. C'est la raison pour laquelle, et c'est comme ça qu'on a eu une immobilisation à travers une e-sensibilisation et ce qui nous amène à une e-révolution. Ces e-révolutions, en fait, ont permis tout simplement de dénoncer plusieurs décisions qui, qui ont eu à être prises, soit par euh, le pouvoir en place ou soit aussi par les, par les opposants. Donc, eux, ils étaient là, ils ne faisaient pas, en fait, de distinction entre le, ceux qui sont au pouvoir et tout simplement les les opposants. Donc, grâce aux médias sociaux, euh, les Sénégalais ont utilisé Internet comme un véritable canal d'influence pour un sursaut citoyen. C'est un outil de, tout simplement, de communication. Ça veut dire quoi Moi qui suis là, pendant les manifestations qu'il y a eu au Sénégal, qui ont été organisées euh, la plupart du temps par des, 
mouvements citoyens ou bien des fois par les opposants, on savait tout ce qui se passait en fait sur place, avant même que la télévision ou bien avant même que les radios n'en parlent. Par exemple, il y a un, un site internet euh, seneweb.com où il mettait une page spécialement pour qu'on ait en direct l'ensemble des, des tweets. Donc, ce qui veut dire quoi Que les réseaux sociaux, Facebook et Twitter, se sont positionnés tout simplement comme étant de véritables relayeurs d'informations à temps réel sur les manifestations et surtout sur les sorties de l'ensemble des candidats à l'élection présidentielle. Maintenant, euh, ce qui s'est passé après tout ça, ça veut dire tout simplement à travers en fait l'information qui passait au niveau des réseaux sociaux, les pouvoirs en place, en fait, se sont rendus compte qu'ils ne pouvaient plus censurer l'information. Pourquoi Parce que l'information, on les avait en direct. On avait à peu près 300 e-observateurs à travers euh, le pays. On demandait à chaque jeune qui avait son portable, qui avait son compte Twitter ou bien son compte Facebook, dès qu'il est dans son bureau de vote, dès qu'il y a une information qu'il juge très importante, automatiquement, il envoyait un tweet et tout le monde était informé à temps réel. Donc, l'information ne pouvait pas être censurée. Même les résultats, en fait, des, euh, des élections présidentielles, on les avait à travers les tweets. Maintenant, euh, ce qui s'est passé, après, on a les journalistes même, les, que ce soit les radios, que ce soit les télévisions, qui ont vu que cette plateforme, sous nous 2012, avait une certaine force. Eux ils, aussi, ils se sont dit... Oh, Puisqu'il y a ça, puisque tout le monde en fait est au niveau des tweets, pourquoi nous aussi nous n'allons pas créer des comptes Twitter pour essayer aussi de véhiculer l'information Et même aussi pendant la campagne électorale, les candidats à l'élection présidentielle se sont aussi rendus compte de la force de ces réseaux sociaux et eux tous, ils avaient leur page Facebook pour faire les campagnes, pour tout simplement essayer de mobiliser le maximum de Sénégalais euh, pour... Euh, pour sa réussite. Maintenant, on est arrivé petit à petit à la naissance de ce qu'on appelle le NTS. Le NTS, c'est le nouveau type de Sénégalais. Parce que les jeunes se sont rendus compte tout simplement qu'ils avaient une certaine force. Et ils voulaient véhiculer un message. Quel était le message Nous devons créer un nouveau type de Sénégalais qui va respecter les normes, qui va respecter les règles et qui va tout simplement aussi respecter les lois qui régissent la société sénégalaise. Les lois qui régissent la, la société sénégalaise et que le nom de Sénégalais, si on va quelque part, que tout le monde sache que nous sommes un pays de démocratie et c'était très important pour nous tous. Et plus important aussi pour, pour les jeunes. Maintenant, il y a autre chose aussi qui est, qui est important au niveau, par exemple, du Sénégal et pourquoi les jeunes se retrouvent un peu plus aussi au niveau des réseaux sociaux, c'est que nous sommes tout simplement une culture euh, d'interaction. Qu'est-ce que j'appelle une culture d'interaction Le Sénégalais aime discuter. Je ne parle pas du jeune en général, mais je ne par, euh, parle pas du jeune en particulier, mais je parle du Sénégalais en général. Nous aimons discuter, nous aimons partager, nous aimons échanger nos, nos idées. Et les réseaux sociaux, que ce soit Facebook, que ce soit Twitter, nous permettent d'échanger, nous permettent de donner notre position sur un sujet bien déterminé. Et voilà une des raisons qui fait aussi que tous les jeunes Sénégalais se retrouvent dans ces réseaux sociaux-là. Maintenant, il y a une question qui va se poser. OK, on se retrouve dans ces réseaux sociaux, on dit ce qu'on pense, on, euh, on envoie des informations, on partage nos photos, on partage nos vidéos. Mais quel est le comportement réellement à avoir pourquoi je pose euh, cette question Parce que tout simplement, je vais vous raconter une autre, une autre anecdote. Un jour, je suis rentrée à la maison après le travail. J'ai ma sœur, en fait, qui est venue et nous étions en train de discuter. Elle avait 13 ans. Elle me dit, Nata, je dis oui, Sally, qu'est-ce qui se passe Elle me dit, non, il y a une élève de mon école qui a été mise à la porte. Je lui demande, ah bon, pourquoi Qu'est-ce qu'elle a fait elle n'était pas contente d'un de ses professeurs, donc elle a écrit sur sa page Facebook qu'elle n'était pas contente sur son professeur. Donc je ne vais, je vais pas vous dire exactement ce qu'elle a écrit sur sa page Facebook. Malheureusement pour elle, 
la directrice de l'école est tombée dessus et elle a eu une sanction. On l'a mis en fait, on l'a exclue de, de l'école. Je lui dis, ouais. Elle a été exclue de l'école. Mais toi, quelle est l'analyse que tu fais de ça C'est parce que ce qu'elle a écrit sur sa page Facebook, c'est pas bon. Mais derrière, moi, la question que je me pose réellement, c'est qu'on a les jeunes qui utilisent Facebook, on a les jeunes qui utilisent Twitter, mais réellement, est-ce qu'ils sont conscients de l'information qu'ils doivent mettre sur ces pages-là, sur l'information qu'ils doivent partager avec leurs amis Ça veut dire derrière qu'il y a un travail que nous devons faire envers ces jeunes-là pour leur dire exactement ce qu'il faut faire et ce qu'il ne faut pas faire. Quels sont les comportements à avoir Et d'autant plus, il y a un comportement qui est très important, à mon avis, c'est quand les jeunes créent leur compte Facebook. Il y a un accord qui est là. Mais combien prennent le temps de lire ces accords Je n'ai pas le pourcentage en tête, mais je, me, je dirais que ça, peut, ça va aller de l'ordre de 1% à la volée comme ça. Mais ça veut dire que derrière ces accords renferment des éléments très importants sur l'utilisation des informations que les jeunes vont partager en, en ligne. Donc il faut les conscientiser à faire la part des, la part des choses. Qu'est-ce qu'il faut mettre en ligne Qu'est-ce qu'il ne faut pas mettre en ligne Ils s'y retrouvent. Pour eux, ce qui est important, c'est que tout simplement, ils se retrouvent au niveau de ces, de ces réseaux sociaux. Ils ont quelqu'un avec qui discuter. Remarque, beaucoup de jeunes, ils ne peuvent pas rester une heure de temps sans pour autant voir ce qu'il y a sur, euh, sur leur page. Quelles sont les informations qui, qui ont été envoyées S'ils n'ont pas leur ordinateur pour se connecter, tout le monde cherche des appareils, des téléphones de dernière génération où ils peuvent se connecter par Wi-Fi ou bien même la 3G que proposent nos opérateurs pour voir ce qu'il y a réellement derrière ces comptes. Twitter et Facebook. Donc, il y a une grande question qui se pose là. Maintenant, derrière cette sensibilisation, qui doit s'en occuper C'est moi C'est M. Ted C'est M. Henri C'est qui Donc, il faudra qu'on puisse y réfléchir pour savoir, dans chaque pays, dans chaque communauté, qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire Quelles sont les actions qu'il faut faire Je suis allée dans ce sens-là parce que j'ai entendu... Euh, l'expérience de Slim, j'ai entendu l'expérience du docteur, mais eux tous, ils ont peigné, à mon avis, ces réseaux sociaux comme étant quelque chose de très, très, très génial. Mais il y a une question qu'il faut se poser. Est-ce que c'est si génial que ça Quels sont les avantages Quels sont les inconvénients Voilà un peu moi ce que j'avais à dire par rapport à ces réseaux sociaux-là. Merci beaucoup. Tell me you're not excited now. <laughs> Thank you very much. You know, one of the things that, that she was, as I mean, that was talking, I was thinking, and Facebook always advertises that they are now the third largest country in the world, just based on the number of people that they have. And so what that also, what you made me think about is that there's no one governing the usage of the internet. So what does it mean that we have a community that's the third largest in the world um, that doesn't have any governance? And so as we continue to have these discussions, um, we'll be thinking about those things. And, and in particular, um, I'm, I'm taken by your conversation with the youth, because it, it really is the wild, wild west, if you will, out there in an ungoverned place. Um, and, and, and our youth are out there by themselves. So we'll have more conversation about that um, as we move forward. So let me introduce our, our next panelist here. Paco. I got this. <laughs> Paco Racaheles. Yes. There you go. Okay. <laughs> In 1997, uh, Paco, along with a group of friends, co founded Campus Party in Malaga, which has grown to become the largest and most influential event in Spain and Latin America. After Campus Party's second year, Paco left radio to focus on other projects. He is currently fully dedicated to the international expansion of Campus Party and to de developing the widest geek community on the planet. With the mission of creating um, hashtag something better, a social movement focused on raising conscious, 
uniqueness among geeks to use their skills and talents responsibly, responsibly and for the benefit of humanity. Um, Paco has a little video for us to see uh, to demonstrate his work, but I'll let him introduce it. Thank you. Uh, I go speak in Spanish in my language. It's better for me. Uh, gracias por estar aquí. Eh, quería poneros un vídeo en el que os voy a enseñar algunas cosillas sobre nuestro evento Campus Party. Pero antes quería compartir un par de reflexiones de las cosas que hemos estado escuchando aquí a lo largo de la mañana, con los, la tarde con los compañeros. Lo primero es que yo no creo que el mail haya muerto. Es, están surgiendo otras formas de relacionarnos, pero el, el mail no está muerto. Hay más herramientas. Y yo creo que en el futuro nos tendrán que dar una dirección IP al nacer y que todos tengamos nuestra IP y sobre ahí conectar las diferentes herramientas que vayan apareciendo. O sea que, por favor, sugiero que propulguemos una IP para cada niño al nacer o un rango de IPs para que pueda hacer con ellos más cosas. Esa sería una buena idea. Bueno, en el décimo aniversario de Campus Party, hace ya muchos años, Stephen Hawking nos dijo que se estaba creando una nueva conciencia mundial gracias a Internet. Está claro que las redes sociales nos permiten estar conectados, hablar, comunicados. Muchos compañeros de la mesa están implicados en los cambios que a nivel político se está produciendo gracias a Internet. Hemos escuchado cosas muy interesantes. Todos recordamos la primavera árabe o lo que pasó el año pasado en España con acampada sol y diferentes movimientos que han surgido eh, en el mundo entero. Pero yo quería profundizar un poco más en un aspecto que para mí es el que más me emociona del poder de las redes sociales. Creo que hay algo más profundo en el que me quería, quería yo hoy eh, profundizar un poquito. ¿Cuántos de los que estáis aquí habéis usado alguna vez el IRC hace muchos años? Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. Ok. Eh, las redes sociales actuales no son más que lo que ya teníamos hace 20 años, pero son más sencillas, más potentes, permiten mejorar mucho la experiencia social online de las personas. El IRC fue como comenzamos nosotros campus, gracias a esa red social de hace 20 años que nos, permita, nos permitía estar conectados. Esa red de personas. Eh, los seres humanos somos capaces de lo mejor y de lo peor. La diferencia entre cuando lo hacemos bien y cuando lo hacemos mal normalmente es cuando hablamos los unos con los otros. Si hablamos, las cosas suelen salir mal, bien y si no hablamos, suelen salir mal. Imagínate de lo que es capaz el ser humano si además de hablar, trabaja junto y sus cerebros piensan juntos y pensamos juntos en cómo rediseñar el mundo. Las redes sociales nos permiten esto, nos permiten transformar el planeta porque estamos juntando cerebros para construir un mundo mejor. No los tres o cuatro o cinco de la pandilla de amigos de toda la vida, sino millones de personas, millones de amigos en el planeta pensando juntos para crear cosas, para compartir cosas y para construir un mundo nuevo. Esta es la potencia de las redes sociales. Claro que nos están permitiendo cambiar la política y hace mucha falta. Hay que cambiar un poquito el planeta para construir algo mejor. Pero estamos creando y se está acelerando muchísimo el poder de creación del ser humano gracias a compartir el conocimiento y las redes sociales ayudan a que esas personas se conecten. Tengo un vídeo de solo cinco minutos que explica un poco lo que nosotros estamos haciendo con Campus en ese esfuerzo nuestro de juntar a los cerebros. Nosotros decimos, como nuestro eslogan, que Internet no es una red de ordenadores, que Internet es una red de personas. Y aquí Miguel nos va a poner un vídeo en el que sale un poquito qué es Campus Party. For one week only, Sao Paulo is the place to be. Technology addicts from across South America have descended on an exhibition hall, bringing with them their machines and their ideas. They're here to learn at some 400 lectures, but mainly these 24-hour campus party people are here to share their knowledge and feed off each other's enthusiasm. People I've never heard about, people I talked only through MSN or Skype or online, I can uh, actually talk to them, exchange ideas, maybe start a project like I did last time. I study electronic engineering, so I'm here with my friends from college to actually enjoy the whole event and learn something. You learn everything about development games and social media, you know, it's very, very awesome. For some, it's all just too much. So, when everything's plugged in and booted up, this is what thousands of people and their computers look like. And if you think this hall is massive, well, the one next door is even bigger. 
the bedroom, if you will. Cramped conditions don't seem to bother anyone. Although, after a week of hacking and sleeping together, this place can get a little... Ahem, pungent. It's like Las Vegas for geeks. There are no windows and very little sense of whether it's day or night. This graph of network traffic says it all. 3am isn't bedtime, it's peak time. So look at the place. So many people, so much stuff going on. I mean, how do you possibly work out what the gossip is? What's the buzz? Who's working with who? Well, you do what everyone else says. That is, you join up with your good friends, Mr Laptop and Mrs Twitter, and uh, let's see what we can rustle up here. So, Sere que arquem gostaria de jogar uma partida de Call of Duty comigo? And send? Yeah, yeah. Cool. This is the beating heart of the operation, where 10 gigabits per second is pumping into the room. That's about a thousand times quicker than a decent home broadband link. The Campuseros are working these fibres hard, giving the network provider the chance to test drive the latest techniques for maxing out these jumbo connections. We can provide here some experience to the campus users that they don't have in, in their real life. There are some brains here working hard to uh, develop something new. It means that would you like to see here in a few years some guys that will provoke a very huge revolution in the web. Over on the main stage, a self-proclaimed revolutionary, former US Vice President Al Gore, is just as much a champion of the web as he is of tackling climate change. Truly starting with the World Wide Web, this new ability for individuals to connect to one another digitally and to explore a universe of knowledge at their own pace according to their own curiosity and to connect to others who had common interests has reawakened the possibility that we can bring democracy to vivid life. And the man whose bright idea allowed us all to connect online has jetted in to survey the proceedings for himself. I have learned that the most exciting thing about all this technology is that people do with it things that you could never have imagined. And here in South America, they know all about collaborative coding. The open source movement is huge here. As glossy as anything from the big games companies, these titles are open source and they're free. The same applies to the Linux operating system. It's especially widely used in Brazil, so when one of its founding fathers pays a visit, no wonder he's mobbed like a rock star. We do a lot of work over the internet, but my observation has been that when people get together in a room and can point and you know talk to each other and share food and share ideas, that they do it at a much more rapid place. And also arguments that may have gone for months over the internet are quashed in a matter of minutes. Now don't go thinking it's all about coding. Campus Zeros like getting their hands dirty too. A pimped up PC is essential. This one's super cooled and encrusted with LEDs. Very bling. In fact, you can do spreadsheets on it as well, apparently. Elsewhere at the party, things are getting seriously innovative. After 30 years of computing in two dimensions, I'm getting the hang of doing it in 3D. Hey people, I'm on TV. Well, on a webcam, on a normal tablet PC. Normal webcam on the back of it. A normal table down here with my BBC pass now using the tablet. I'm about to do something just a little bit cool with this stylus. It's gone, airbrushed out in real time on this tablet. Fantastic. For the time being, it's just a student project, but one day this software could be removing brand logos on live TV, so you may just see it in action, or not. And with this experimental hardware, you can channel your inner geek. Just twist the dial to select a bit of Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, and you're away. And this is definitely one of a kind. The simulator's been created by two brothers in their spare time. Software and player are strapped together on a rotating gimbal. It's not as easy as it looks. I'm stalling. I don't think I'm stalling, I think I'm dying. Those of you at the back, I apologise, you may have spilt your tea and coffee by now. 
There's no shortage of energy in here, whether the power's on or off. And these are certainly a creative bunch. In fact, they've uploaded more code, photos, video and vlogs this week than they've downloaded. The party might be over for another year, but it's left the net a slightly bigger and brighter place than it was before. Esto es tan solo una pequeña representación de lo que está sucediendo en el planeta, que aquí se ve muy claro porque hay 8000 campuseros juntos, pero hay millones de personas, millones de gentes jóvenes que están colaborando en crear nuevos proyectos y revolucionando el planeta. Y para mí esa es una de las utilidades que tienen las redes sociales más allá de que la gente se pueda conectar y charlar. Van a, crear, van a cambiar el planeta y lo están haciendo juntos y eso es maravilloso. Gracias. Thank you, Paco. I'm looking forward to next year in Silicon Valley. You told me I have an invitation? Of course. I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> All right. Our last speaker before we get to the Q&A portion. Um, and then I'm going to uh, give all of us a two-minute break to stand up and stretch our legs and arms because we've been in here for a little bit more than an hour right now. Um, it's Garrett, Garrett McNamara. Uh, Garrett is an entrepreneur and information security specialist. He has extensive experience in helping clients focus on major technology issues, domain dispute arbitration, and advising clients on, clients on best practices for technology, marketing, sales, design, and government contracting. He's a vetted organization leader. Garrett holds numerous technology and entrepreneur awards. He is a graduate of George Mason University in Virginia and continues to advise the university on technology and entrepreneur projects. He regularly speaks and attends conferences both domestically and overseas and volunteers time with the Internet Society. Garrett? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I feel, uh, feel like i got to follow up with everyone here with uh, their bios. But yeah, I'm here to, um, to represent youth and those young at heart. Um, I start social media companies uh, in, during my nights and weekends. Um, I do security research as well, so cyber security research uh, with viruses and everything else. Um, and I'm an IT and business student currently as well, so I'm constantly busy. Um, I'm from Washington in the United States, and I'm on the, uh, the council of the D.C. chapter there, so I'm here to represent them as well. Um, and I'm here to represent Internet business, so kind of like the, the revenue and the money side of um, a lot of this collaboration, how it could be leveraged by, by companies to better interact with um, their customers and to serve them better uh, through, you know, for instance, through like quality assurance or user feedback. Um, I'm here because the Internet is a, a great equalizer, so it's a, it's a level playing field for everyone. Um, the importance and reliance on the Internet is growing. I mean, it's, it's already here today, we know that, but it's, it's growing every day. It's becoming a more important part of our lives, so it's not something that is ever going to go away, and it's not something we could ignore. Uh, this is something that we're all invested in, we need to pay attention to. And I, just like everyone else in this room, is an Internet citizen, so I feel like I need to take my part and be involved. Um, I mean, on the, from the business side of things and from the networking and career um, side, uh, a social media account can be both an asset and a liability. Um, you can very quickly <laughs> show that you know something and you are a subject matter expert or you're an up-and-coming subject matter expert in your field, and you can very quickly um, and mistakenly take all that away. Uh, I've seen that happen uh, with a lot of celebrities where they start feuds and their agent will get a hold of them and talk some reason into them, but you know, the damage has already been done. Uh, they can delete the messages, but their, their followers have already seen everything. Um, for an individual, if you are working to like, network, and especially this is particular to people who are graduating and just about to apply for their first job, um, one of the biggest pieces of career advice I keep hearing again and again is to kind of blog and to write in your field and become a subject matter expert and I see uh, social networks being used in addition to blogs quite a bit to amass a following of not only other people in the field but also the subject matter experts in the field. Um, and that's why, that's something I think that companies look into when they're making new hires um, because not only are you getting a good candidate but you're getting the ears of all the other people that follow them. Um, and if I mean, you're hiring someone that believes in your company, so you're getting their public endorsement as well, because if they're interested in your company, they're interested in your field, they're going to be posting about what's going on. Um, so they're going to alleviate, well, it's free marketing, 
so they're going to alleviate from your uh, marketing budget. But um, again, I mean, there's no filter. This is this is a hyper environment where you can share anything very quickly, very instantly, um, for free. Where distance doesn't matter anymore. It used to be, you pay for distance uh, to talk to someone on the other side of the globe, and right now it's just you know, a few milliseconds latency and you can push a message anywhere um, for the same cost as it is to push it to your neighbor. So um, just be, it's, it's something that you definitely need to kind of embrace is very, very powerful. It's not, it, it's not to be viewed as a toy, um, I don't think, if, you, <laughs> if you're concerned about your image and everything else. So that's, uh, that's basically it. I'm here to uh, represent the, the business side of things. All right, well, thank you, Eric. <laughs> so we're going to do some, some Q&A, but why don't everybody just take a couple of minutes, stand up, stretch your arms, stretch your legs. You've been sitting in that same spot for, for over an hour now. Uh, don't leave the room, now, <laughs> but, but do stretch and get your blood flowing a little bit, and then we'll get right to questions and answers. And I have a I couple have of ask questions that I want to ask. Can I leave the room? Huh? Can I leave the room? If, only if you come back. Be right back. All right. <laughs> okay, we'll start to formally start the Q&A process here. Um, before we do, I want to just relate to you a couple of things that people walked up to me um, during the, the break and set. Um, one of them reminded me of, of our responsibility um, in the face that we've got multi-generations using the internet. Um, and I was telling her about the last time we had a going away party for our librarian. I looked around our organization and we had people from five generations working. And one, I remember one of the young ladies um, using Outlook and asking me what the CC stood for in the email. And I said, the CC stands for carbon copy. And she says, well, what's carbon? <laughs> And I said, well, when you used to use type, and I said, oh, forget it. <laughs> oh, forget about it. But, it, but, but um, the, the fact that we have older generations um, in the workplace, people who were not digital natives, people who were born long before there was anything um, like the internet came up in our conversation. And the young, the young lady right here said she was going to tell us a quick story. So I'll have her um, tell us a quick story if I can find a microphone here. You got a mic right there at your desk. So turn your mic switch on and tell us the story that you told me. <laughs> My name is Christine Maxwell. I'm a former direct, uh, director on the board of uh, the Internet Society. And uh, we were having a chat about, uh, well, in my case, I, I told the story about my 91-year-old mother. And uh, she always made it her business to have three computers uh, because she traveled a lot and she always had her little bag of tricks and it was a serious nightmare but she was absolutely intent on being with it and she wanted to get on YouTube and she do her shopping she was extraordinary in that regard uh, but it it leaves me always with the feeling that you know those of us who have the the fortune to be you know, able, be savvy enough to use the internet in many different ways and, and have different ac access points, etc. I think we have a responsibility to help those of us around, particularly in this case, the older generation who, who you know, they, they want to be able to, in the first instance, what drives them is being able to still connect with grandchildren. That's for the most part why elderly people want that. But, you know, as, as things go forward, uh, I think that it is important as we come up with new ideas and new applications not to forget that we need to include them also. All right. Thank you for that. Um, so we've got uh, some questions in from the outside, from the internet, actually there. You, you want to read a couple of those for me? Sure. So just to say that we have about 60 people participating online. There are two remote hubs from Lebanon with 25 and Cameroon with 25 about. Another remote hub from Trinidad and Tobago. And we have a question first from India. India. Is social networking really helping people to survive or grow their economies? 
social networking should become global collaboration knowledge platform and not for wasting time on personal links? That's one question. Okay. So the question now, Garrett? Well, I'll start that off. I did see that in the chat room. And um, social networking is, is just a, like something you use. So I think that that's dictated by the people. I mean, we got a couple, a couple questions. One was about content um, and the relevancy of content. Maybe it's, it's stuff that you use just to waste time. But um, how are you going to, I mean, how are you going to get away from that? Are you going to have people, what I'm getting at is like censorship is probably the only way to combat that. And do you want censorship on your social networks? How are you going to filter out relevant content from irrelevant content beyond just following, you know, people that you trust based on trust? Um, but I don't, I don't see an easy way to fix, you know, filtering out noise from something that can make you or your community better. Okay. Anybody else with an answer? Yeah. Slim? I, I wanted to say that um, social networks are, are really, I, I wanted to emphasize that uh, social networks are really very, very basic infrastructure for building society. I mean, it's uh, important for democracy. Uh, you can uh, build, uh, it's important for governance, uh, so that if you're, uh, I mean, she, she's saying that uh, how can, can it help us survive? Uh, if you uh, are an, have uh, some plants or you are doing agriculture, it's important to be connected to other agriculture, uh, to other people working on agriculture. It's important to be connected with uh, the, the weather forecasts. It's important to be connected all, all, with all that stuff. And all that stuff is, is uh, possible using social networks because it connects people. So you could know that uh, a storm is coming from the, uh, the other uh, town over there and make the, the right decisions about that fact. And uh, so yes, it's, it's important for surviving too. I just wanted to add it, uh, to add, um, uh, concluding what uh, Garrett and Selim uh, said, that the social networks have revolutionized the definition of local content. Uh, we used to define local content even on the internet maybe 10 years ago that it's in the same language the proximity to each other are using the same content and local content this now definition is not valid anymore it has been revolutionized it is a content that is relevant to a certain community and this has even changed the definition of local content compared to 10 years ago when we were talking uh, just about uh, web content and websites. And it is definitely worth to mention that access to pipes is meaningless without the transformational effect that really exists with the content and with the e-content and the developmental aspect and the socio-economic developmental aspect that is related to that. The access to pipes are meaningless. Thank you. Um, I've actually got a question that I want to ask, and it's, it's based on uh, a couple of your responses earlier. Um, during the break, somebody asked me, you know, how do you characterize what you see young people doing on social media in the United States? Because when I hear you guys tell the stories about transforming lives um, and monitoring elections and the like, uh, when I think about the, the majority use of social media in the United States, it's entertainment. It's entertainment, it's, it's friends, it's that sort of thing. And somebody asked me how to I'd characterize it. And the best way I can think of it is people living their lives out loud in, 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 in ways that they never did before. And so I was struck by Aminata's uh, uh, plea to us um, to think about youth and privacy and security and all of those kinds of issues. So my question to you guys is, is what do you think we ought to do about that? What can we do um, to, with the youth and in all countries to protect them from what can be sometimes the bad side of the internet. Snip? Um, I think that the, the, uh, it's um, always the same problem with 
uh, asking the question in, in this way. You know, uh, uh, there is no bad side of the internet. There is um, simply bad side of the people. Uh, people. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, uh, it's uh, um, when you think about this, and when you think about regulation, and when you think about security, you have to remove the pipes from the equation and uh, make your reasoning about people and simply people and to pay very much attention and to, to keep the pipes neutral. Got it. So, uh, yeah, there is a bad side, but there is, I, I, I liked a lot your story about your, your, um, uh, your niece. Your, your, niece. Yeah. your niece, yeah, your niece who had friends all over the world. And uh, uh, to be uh, someone who's living in the U.S., and to feel someone who, uh, from the same age who is feeling in Iraq, and to have uh, understand those problems of someone who could get to school because there is people shooting each other in the street, this is very important very for good. the collective consciousness I was talking about. Because mm -hmm. in the Tunisian Revolution, we got helped because we got felt by the people all around the world because they identified in our problems. And th this kind of thing, and these simple things, being friends, uh, um, sharing the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the experience of every day, and those kind of contacts remove uh, and uh, ensure very, very basic needs of humanity. And they remove things like um, uh, um, uh, xenophobia. Mm -hmm. They remove uh, 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 fearing the other. They remove, uh, uh, th they impeach racism. Mm -hmm. they, and this for our future society is very, very important. Uh, I wanted to ask to answer your question as well. You were explaining the problem and what could we do? I think one thing that we can do is simply educate. We have to educate young people on how to use the tools with common sense. Without doubt, it's a, very, it's a group of very young people who have extremely powerful tools. And no one is applying common sense to the tools and showing how we have to apply it. People are just given a tool, tell how to use it, and that's it. I don't know how we say it in English, as speaker. We say and we had an an education which was a citizen's education, but that's not being short. We're not being shown, and we're not teaching our young people how to behave on the internet, how things have to be done. Maybe we need a bit more training and education. One Slim for reminding us that, that um, although the, the internet uh, and, and is a very special tool, it's still a tool, and it's the human element that we have to, to manage in that environment. Mina? Yes, I would like to add that it all depends on what country we're talking about. In Senegal, we experienced problems during the elections. Youth met up and asked, uh, they asked themselves what they could do. Now, it wouldn't be the same in the U.S., but I think we need to raise the awareness of youth. Sorry, I'd like to know what problems you're talking about. I've had that question since earlier on. Well, going back to the presidential elections in Senegal, the outgoing president, Abdullah Ward, wanted to he wanted to um, run at the election for, for, for president. He wanted to take part in the elections, and it was a matter of knowing whether he could go for a third term or not. There were a lot of people who said no. The current president, the outgoing president, does not have the right to do so. So communities met up. The Senegalese bloggers said, well, whatever the decision taken by the Constitutional Council, the main thing 
is that information gets across, whatever the result of the decision is. If the Council decides, and it did, that the President could run again, the Senegalese needed to be informed. And the tool that these youngsters had at hand to pass the information on was uh, n social networks. Slim's question. But what problems exactly? Did, were they fighting in the streets? Were, were there protests? What happened? Answer. Well, you have to distinguish between those who were fighting in the streets and those who uh, were just uh, transmitting information. I'm speaking about the latter. Whatever side they were on, whether they were supporting uh, those in power or the opponents, they all they were doing was transferring information, getting information across. And that's what's important, because they knew how to use tools that were available online to get the information across and say to the Senegalese, this is what's happening, this is what's going on, and it's now up to you to decide whether you're going to vote in favor of the outgoing president or not. So it was up to each Senegalese to make up his mind. That was the message they wanted to get across. Thank you. I'll speak in French. Actually, I wanted to seize this opportunity to say that there is a similarity between what we see with social networks, and I'll use the example of Africa. Uh, along with what happened in Senegal and the Arab Spring. And if you, you can actually establish a similarity with uh, mobile phones. What has happened in Africa has gone well beyond what happened elsewhere. Why? Because mobile phones in Africa met the needs, met needs that existed. That is the need to communicate. In Africa, people often have two or three mobiles, one mobile to speak with their family and one to speak with friends, and then sometimes they don't have the means to, char to recharge their mobiles. But it all happened overnight, uh, not having any mobiles at all and then suddenly using mobiles on a daily basis because there was a need there. So now, looking at the Internet, maybe youth throughout the world is using a tool, not because we force them to use it, but because it's youth's way of adopting that tool. So when we speak of Internet for all, I would say Internet for everyone, for everything, because the use of Internet is being reviewed on a daily basis, it's a matter of seeing how to ensure that a correct use of this Internet is, is made. So, yes, there may be examples of kids who can put a video online and are incapable of tying their own shoelaces. So, yes, children may be, know how to use the Internet, but they need to be educated as well. And technicians knew, need to use, need to play a role as well. And it's not only regarding youth. All those people who are encouraged to use the Internet to do their shopping online and to do their banking transactions online, well, they won't adopt these new systems unless Internet is secure. Thank you. I'm going to alternate questions from here and online and make sure we include the online contingent as well. Is that okay with everybody? Okay, good. This is from Cameroon. According to Dr. Tarek's explanation, do you think the freedom of expression on the Internet could open the door to violence in the society or any other manifestation that isn't safe for people? Do you feel this could be? 
Do you think the freedom of the internet, expression on the internet, could open the door to violence in the society or any other manifestation that isn't safe for people? No, I always think that the internet brings benefits by far more than any uh, uh, other bad sides that exist. And as it has been mentioned, uh, related to bad content, there are bad people, but not a bad internet because the internet is a tool. But let me add in this uh, direction that I see it a little bit different. We have a responsibility as a community. We can't just lean back and say, well, it is like this, and the young people uh, are uh, just leading and utilizing it, and the, co the overall global community has to swallow it like this. No, there is a responsibility for us. We should not create a vacuum as a technical and enlightened community. We should be up to our responsibility to work on enlightening people, on awareness, on self-regulation, on a cross-border level worldwide, because this is important to enlighten people and to make people aware and to, uh, um, to, to, uh, not to create a vacuum. We need to address the issues before they become problems, because if, the, if we leave them until they become problems, other people from other organizations and from other communities will jump in and take the leadership of this wonderful tool, maybe taking the leadership of controlling it and changing it and using it in a wrong direction. So we cannot just lean back and say, no, we don't have anything to do with it. We should work on self-regulation, create communities for self-regulation, and leverage the technical community and the know-how that we really have in order to have and continue to have an open, secure, and free, and uh, neutral and affordable internet. And very important in this aspect is to build what uh, the gentleman uh, from Senegal has mentioned, to uh, also explain the positive aspects. It's not, it's not just about entertainment, using social media for entertainment as the US, no, it is as well using social media for creating jobs, for creating value add for people, for their, for their simple economies. And this is a very important aspect to be explained and to be elaborated and continue also to be uh, promoted so that the positive aspects of the Internet prevail on any negative uh, aspects concerning the utilization. Thank you. May I add something? Yes. Um, I'd say on the contrary. Uh, uh, Internet uh, um, uh, removes violence because people get violent when uh, they feel unheard and misunderstood. And Internet participates, and especially social network participates in making more dialogue, so it hinders violence. Okay. You have a comment to that? I have a comment to that, but I also have another comment. So which one do you want to go first? <laughs> okay. If you've got a comment to that, let's do that okay. one first. Okay, okay, okay. fair enough. Uh, well, uh, I do not agree with you, because uh, you're well, probably very well aware that there are lots of different groups of people on the Internet who get hurt, not by their, their own personal experience from real life, uh, but by correlating to uh, other people they, they feel um, emphatic to. So, you know, it is very easy to organize. I'm not only talking about terrorist organizations, I'm talking to different kinds of people. So you can have these uh, diverse dynamics, which, you know, are maybe not, not uh, in vogue right now, but which, in, which can develop in totally unpredicted ways. Okay. This gentleman right here had a question for a long time, no. so let me get um, this question. Le time. Quiero primero a este. I want to thank this uh, Latin American Catalan for all his work. Thank you. I, I would like to say to the lady representing Senegal, thank you so much for having shared that with us. I may be the older in this room. Probably. I don't know. I feel like, anyway. But you know, in uh, primitive generations, the knowledge of people were well, the old people. Les savants Los sabios eran los mayores. Well, I came to this uh, inner world in 1995, I think, I guess, in Canada. I was ambassador in Ottawa at that time. And I had a very big problem with Canadians. And that was that all the fishermen around the northeast side in front of the St. Lawrence River getting out there for, for centuries, the Basque, the Galicians, they used to go there fishing. Uh, well, in any case, they read me a vessel out in the high seas. They harassed us for almost a month. Finally, I took the vessel out of the 
Harbor of um, La Nueva Tierra, Newfoundland, Terra Nova, Tierra Nueva, and uh, I'll try to talk to Canadians about my problem. Nobody wanted to listen to me. I was cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste, and everyone. So what I say was wrong. So I said to myself, well, I got a program in the local area network of Ottawa in Ontario. That was the very beginning. I'm talking about 1992. We got a program out of Carlton University, probably one of the best universities in technology. And we had this local area network where I put, I mean, the first one was the L'ambassade de France, de la grandeur, l'office de l'ambassadeur, la tapisserie, etc. Then è venuto un italiano molto intelligente che si chiamava Coniglio, che ha messo la storia dell'Italia. And then I thought, God, I should put my history, it's a very old one. I should put my cultures, at least we have five or six different cultures. I should put my languages, we have probably seven or eight different languages in Spain besides Castilian. And I should put all the ways about tourism, wines, uh, you know, flamenco, and enjoy your life. And I got it in the land. And I'm going to close very quickly. As soon as I realized what I have to use the internet, nobody will cut and paste me anymore. And in 48 hours, you know, the two wonderful guys from uh, Carlton University, Fred Williams and, and Neil Holtz, changed all the land into the first World Wide Web Embassy in the world. I was the first. That was about 15 years ago. Well, it was such an event. It was such a success all over Canada and the, you know, the nearby states, Vermont, etc., New Hampshire, etc., that we got millions and millions and millions of hits. And it happened to me that I was selected as a very strange ambassador to be part of the member of the Internet Board of Trustees from 1996 to 2001. Now, let me tell you, it's unbelievable where we are. And it's going to be unbelievable where we are going to stay. In what? Three, four years, five years, 2017 or 18? We got Twitter, we got Facebook, we got iPad, we got iPhone. Who would have thought? when I was with the poor John Postel at ISOC, when I was with Vinton Serf. But, so, yes, and I finished now. I have a foundation called Fundación Los Alamos in three languages, in Espanol, en Francais, and in English. It's called Fundación Los Alamos. I have a visit card if you want to, to, to look to it. And we are convinced, after eight years of working, and I'm not going to say any more, the basic word is education. Full stop. We have to educate our kids first. And we have a tool. Pocoyo, look at pocoyo.com and you will see the Count of Florida Blanca invented that. Okay. And, and I finish, education takes a word of four basic elements of our society. Very much thought for years, I just wrote a book on that. Globality, interdependence, consciousness of the limitations of the planet in ecology, and speed of change. Okay. Apply all that to education, I will get out something very positive. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I'm sorry. No? Two is so long. I'm sorry. Here we go. I'm not sure I can make any comment after this long, uh, <laughs> very detailed and very intellectual uh, inter <laughs> intervention. I have just only one comment. Um, uh, uh, I have two kids which are young, and I only long look at the social networking as a new way, and uh, 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 very, in a very positive way. And I think that uh, uh, we tend, as, uh, uh, as parents, to blame the internet for things we don't do with our kids, mm. which is communication, support, discussion, 
it's not the internet that we need to blame. It's us who needs to adapt so that we can give our kids a, a, a guidance on how they need to use the internet. That's it. That's all what I need to say. Okay. Thank you. All right, we got another question? Sure. Question from Ghana. What lesson can the rest of Africa learn from SUNU 2012 with respect to using social media to discuss and cover elections issues? SUNU 2012 is a social media campaign that was carried out in the Senegal elections. And the ones that answer in relation especially to the Ghana elections that are coming up called Ghana Decides. Well, to reply to your question, what lessons can be drawn from uh, SUNU 2012, I'd say that for young people and for everybody else, people need to exchange information and they need to adopt their own positions in the light of uh, major debates and they should avoid the negative aspects of uh, demonstrations. Uh, in most African countries we've had uh, problems uh, in the political sphere and I think people can avoid that. They can say, look, information is for everybody. Information isn't just for politicians. It should be shared uh, in real time and everybody should be able to adopt their own position uh, on major debates and uh, that can happen if they can communicate and share information freely and avoid uh, some of the demonstrations that uh, uh, are deplorable some in some cases but aren't uh, because of social networks now as the gentleman said internet is not a bad thing uh, in itself. It all depends on people's education. If people have a bad education, then uh, they're going to communicate uh, badly over the internet and that uh, is going to uh, affect social networks. So we need to educate people and um, we need to educate and inculcate a certain type of behavior. People need to know where information is going to be uh, communicated and uh, what people are going to find out about. And so people need to be educated into how to use social networks as well to communicate effectively. Thank you. I just had a follow-up to that. Actually, it was an anecdote that I forgot to mention in the bio. But um, back last year, I had a, a friend um, who's also a, a Tunisian. He asked me, um, of course, over, over Facebook, so on a social network, if I could help out uh, with him to create a platform upon which um, this was at the time that uh, Tunisia was uh, redoing their government, so there was a number of parties, um, and uh, so many so that the youth, which wanted to be involved in voting for the first time ever, uh, didn't know which parties to focus on, didn't know which parties were most relevant to them, so he came to me asking if I could put together a tool um, to be able to find, well, each party would list what they're for and each user would log in and list what they're interested in and it would match them to the party of that, that is most relevant to them so that they kind of get some guidance as to which party may suit their interests best. So I think that if I wasn't able to take the, the position but um, that would be the sort of tool that may be of use in the future to kind of like enable people to know what's going on more quickly especially when there's so much information out there um, that it's, it's too hard for any one person to digest. Got a question here? Je vais intervenir. I'd like to speak French as well. I'd say that we all know that social networks have a lot of positive elements. But um, we also need to look at the negative effects. And as a mayor, I know that I need to educate uh, people, 
children. I need to say to children in particular, look very carefully at what the information that you're putting on Facebook is, is going to look like in 20, 30 years' time. Imagine if you're going to apply for a senior job in 20 or 30 years' time. Um, someone might look at what you've put on the internet, on Facebook in particular, and say, look, you're not suitable for this position. So that's why it's so important to explain this to children and to students. And we say that uh, when we go into universities and we say to students, it's very important what you put on Facebook. It's our duty, I believe, to raise awareness among young people as to what they should and should not put on social networks. You shouldn't just put any kind of information there. You need to protect young people. We should educate them because, you know, today's world is more and more open. It's a digital environment. But we shouldn't forget that we're talking about human societies that need to be educated and humans are at the very heart of digital networks. And um, that's why there are things that shouldn't be done even if the technical possibility is there. Thank you. Yo quería comentar. Yep. I wanted to comment, to make a comment on what you have just said. I think I totally agree with what you say. I think we need to teach children um, what they can do and they cannot do. But to but there's something we cannot do, and it's to tell young people to not be young. Imagine what you did when you were young. Imagine if you had been able to put it on internet, and so everyone would have known what we did. To tell young youngsters not to be young, it's impossible. This subject is complex. Um, are, do we have the right to forget? Do, do we... Um, the things that uh, we did 20 years ago, can they be recalled now? It's very hard to say be careful now because people, young people need to live and need to do their daily life and their, you know, their experiences and they're going to have consequences that we didn't have, that we don't have. No one knows what we did when we were young. They're not on internet, on the internet, they, they don't have photographs, uh, you know. It's very hard to tell youngsters, uh, act as if you were 40 years old, you know, be cautious. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, as you did. Well, if I could just add something to that, um, to respond to what Miss C has said. You do need to raise awareness among young people of um, the fact that the, there, there is no uh, guarantee of the right uh, for information to be forgotten. Because whenever you put any information on a social network about you or anybody else, in five or ten years' time, a trace of that new information is still going to be there. Any compromising information about somebody uh, is going to be on the World Wide Web for a long, long time, and it might be damaging. It's true that people like to go on social networks because there's a certain freedom, but freedom um, shouldn't impinge on the freedom of others. And that's why we need to raise awareness among young people of the importance of um, being careful about what they put on social networks. Uh, we have the chapters, uh, and they are an opportunity for people to exchange information about these issues, and I think chapters should be organizing activities um, to educate young people and make them aware of the problems uh, of social networks and link to uh, the protection of privacy um, as a whole. Yeah. Uh, uh, one more thing uh, I may add is, uh, yeah, everything uh, stays on the internet. Everything is saved and forever. And then also, uh, everyone should be conscious that uh, everything on the internet, on social networks, is public. Uh, despite what Facebook says and despite what uh, some other social networks say, there is no such a thing as private when you have like a hundred people that are following you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but then there is a positive thing that for young people, for example, for example, uh, you know, when you have all the young people, the whole generation, which has the same compromising photos on the internet, it's not a problem anymore for uh, anyone. It will be uh, something culturally acceptable. You see, 
So uh, it's more mitigated than uh, you think. It's more, less dangerous than you, you may think. I know uh, we fear most of the time the future, but I think I'm more, uh, more positive about that fact. Uh, it won't be a problem that you have your photos drunk at a party in 15 years, no, I think. You know, what, we, what we're seeing, a lot of what we're seeing here, and this, this is the part that fascinates me, is although the internet is a universal language for all of us, and Facebook is a universal tool for all of us, and Twitter is a universal tool for all of us, we still bring our national and our personal, um, I won't call them biases, but opinions, to that conversation. So what might be acceptable in one place or by one community or by one individual may or may not be acceptable um, to others. I had, uh, I remember two years ago, I had a, a, a lady working for me who said, and, and she was the only one in her department who wasn't using um, uh, the, the Facebook page that we had set up. And I said, so what, what's, what's your thing here? You usually accept all technologies. And she said, my objection to Facebook isn't a technological objection. It's an ethical and moral objection. And that was the first time I ever had anybody say to me that a technology was unethical or immoral. So I think because of the kinds of freedoms we now have in these different technology arenas, other kinds of aspects be uh, brought into the conversation that we've not had to deal with before. It's pretty hard to say that a, a word processor is immoral, <laughs> but pretty easy to say that people living their lives out loud, out loud might not be something um, that's my particular cup of tea. I just wanted to add that uh, for policymakers on the internet, whether they come from governments or, or, or even from business or from civil, uh, civil society within the multi-stakeholderism uh, process that uh, we promote as a community and, and as an internet society, when it comes to security, openness, and privacy, there is not one single golden solution that fits everywhere, everybody, and we need to be aware of that right. as such. What can we teach our children? general principles and ethics, but we cannot teach them in details what they are going to be doing uh, uh, on the internet when it comes to the details, because there is not one single solution that fits all. There, uh, and uh, we need to be adaptive, and we need to be uh, receptive to changes with this younger generation. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. So uh, I'm fearing we, we got to some contradiction here because um, we underline how, how quick the internet evolves, how quick the social network evolves. There are changes every day, every night. There are new tools uh, emerging. And we underline that the young are the ones who really know how, how to use these tools, are early adopters of these tools. And then we get to the conclusion that, uh, again, the dangers of all this, uh, of the social network, it's uh, the role of the parents to educate the young, so, the youngsters. So maybe everybody here feels very young in, in, their, in their mind. Mm -hmm. But I doubt that it is the case of every parent in the world. And I don't see how parents can educate the, the young, their, their children. By the way, everything that was said at the beginning shows that it's a youngster that can actually educate their parents right. on how to use the internet. And to come back to the business aspect, because we are not speaking much about it, but if you want to be uh, innovative and creative, you have to listen to the young, not the opposite. Well, it's funny that you said, if you think about the last um, four or five innovative technologies that we're using, all of them were created by somebody who was young. Even if you go all the way back to Microsoft DOS, it was created by somebody who was young. You think about Facebook, you think about Twitter, you think about every major technological innovation that we've had in the last five, 10 years, maybe even 20 years, young folks created them, so it's interesting. I got one question here from the, then I'll get, take some more from the audience, okay? Uh, can I answer him? Yes, you can. 
uh, we're talking here about uh, educating uh, young, uh, not about the use of technology, which of course they are expert at. We're talking here about educating the young uh, on uh, socializing, on not talking to anybody, on making sure that the guy who you're talking to is uh, um, someone who you, who you know, on, on how to uh, uh, cope with the fact that uh, there are uh, people which have uh, bad behavi behaviors and they are exposing it on the internet and uh, all those things that are part of the uh, normal life that you are supposed to educate your, your children about them. So anybody could do that. It's in general. It's not specifically about the internet. Yeah. Excuse me. Just a, a brief note. I, I'm not separating technology from, from education. That's the point. We say that everything that is happening is happening, it's in synergy with technology. So you can answer, we will separate socialization from technology because we are just talking about how socialization is now influenced by technology. Yeah. So you just have to make the normal education. So it, it could be okay. Yo creo que, solo un matiz, yo creo que estamos hablando exactamente de lo mismo. Uh, I think we're talking about exactly the same thing. In the old times, we, we used to say to children, watch out when you cross the street, you have to look both sides. Or we would say to them, don't talk to unknown people. Well, now we have to tell them other things to educate them because there is another reality around. And we don't have to teach them about technology because they use it better than us. We have to teach them common sense. Sometimes till, uh, parents leave their children sitting in front of the computer and and they don't you know they don't tell them how to use the computer i mean they, they, it's like they they leave a child in front of the street and they don't tell them to look both sides before crossing the street can i i would like to ask two questions from the same person um persons from british american descent and she says i think it's a she what are the implications of social media and the worldwide job market pros and cons and a follow-up question how, such, how should social media be introduced, reinforced in education systems around the world? Okay. Repeat? Oh. Yep, repeat it one more time. Now, uh, what are the implications of social media in the worldwide job market? What are the pros and cons? How should social media be introduced or reinforced in the education systems around the world? Okay, so social media and job markets, and some commentary on that, and social media and education. Um, before I ask you guys to answer that, let me say that we've got 15 minutes left. So after we answer that question, I'm going to ask each one of you for some closing comments so we can get people out on time. Is that okay? Okay. So let's answer that, 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 that question. Anybody who wants to take a, a shot at the um, influence and importance of social media and job markets. Okay, you want to do education? Okay, do education. <laughs> Fine. I think definitely the education reform all over the world has been undergoing major changes while utilizing the Internet and inter introducing digital tools within the last five to ten years. It started with broadband connectivity to schools, and we have had uh, a long endeavor in our part of the world to connect schools to Internet on a wider scale, using utilizing broadband. The infrastructure that exists here in the developed world in the U.S. or, or, or Western Europe is not a de facto case when it comes to connectivity in schools and universities in our part of the world. But I think we have done this mission, and we are... Uh, uh, over it. And then we went into an era of three to four years where content development and for education and remote learning was the target. And I think partially, partially, this was adopted um, as well. Now it's collaborative learning. It is about using collaborative learning between the children, between the schools, between the students in, uni uh, in university, and not anymore in one single school. The classroom has changed. The concept of the school has changed. The interaction is not only with the teachers, but it is also with user-generated content and other students and other pupils uh, as well in school, and pupils in other schools, and interaction with the parents uh, uh, as well, and in other parts of the world. So this really have re made a revolution 
when it comes to education and we should build on it. And if we add multilingualism on top of that, then definitely the whole mission becomes more, uh, more difficult uh, as, uh, as such. But I think we are just at the beginning and we need to stay committed to invest further on in education and to provide our children with the right tools for collaborative education and interactive education that uh, they really need to be because the job markets of tomorrow will need these skills. Anybody else on either one? Paco? Si, yo quería... Yes, I wanted to answer about the job market. I think today many people look for work today um, through internet. There is a social red called LinkedIn, we should all be part of. Uh, today, a big part of the population, uh, if, it, if you don't use the social networks, uh, you have difficulty to find a job. Uh, companies look for workers through social networks like LinkedIn. So I think it's critical, it's very important. Okay. All right, so let me ask you guys this, and I'll start it down there with you, Garrett, and we'll work our way up this way. Um, Five minutes, or actually a little bit less than five minutes, just a wrap up of, of, of um, I guess, your, your attitudes and your beliefs about where social media will be, say, five years from now, because if we look out any further, we won't see anything. So, what do you think when you talk about social media in the future? What do you think we're up against in the next three to five years? Well, first, I mean, I think that we need to get the kind of the parenting issue out of the way. Um, <clears throat> a lot of that, I mean, there's no there's no driver's license for the internet, obviously, so I think that a lot of these issues about uh, how younger people use the, uh, the internet is, is a, a people and a parenting issue. It's not an internet issue. Um, I, w a more interesting issue uh, as far as social media that hasn't come up yet, and it, it never really does in a lot of these talks, is uh, the issue of like um, security and you know verified accounts, because you don't take your, uh, in the U.S., you wouldn't take your social security number to Twitter to create an account in your name. They, they don't do much verification. Now, I, I realize they've started to do some verified accounts. But I think um, seeing how trust and our digital identity is worked out in the future um, is going to be really interesting, at least for me, to pay attention to, to see, because, you know, there's a lot of people who want to use social media a lot of uh, celebrities and a lot of people uh, with a lot of followers in the real world, but um, then unfortunately there's a lot of fake accounts and you know parodies and everything else that kind of take away from that very what could be a very useful tool. Paco. Well, the question is, what is going to happen with networks in five years? I think internet is going to stop existing. We're going to stop uh, talking about it. I mean, it, because internet is like electricity. People don't talk about electricity. Well, I think with social networks, it's, it's, they're going to have the same uh, thing. I mean, they're going to be so integrated in our life and in our ways of communicating that these words are going to disappear. I mean, we're all going to use them, and it's going to disappear also as a term. The younger generation has given us all a lesson on utilizing the social media for a political reform, at least in our part of the world. We need now to show some leadership on um, different organizations to utilize social media for both better socioeconomic development aspects. Social media for education, for better education, social media for better health services, uh, social media for better uh, e-governance services and e-government service and civic uh, engagement uh, as well. Uh, to do that, we need to study in the details the penetration of the social media, the demographics distribution of the social media, the gender distribution of the social media uh, as, as such, the adoption rates and uh, 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 the factors that are affecting the adoption rates, whether they are a, um, age brackets or, uh, or income or uh, uh, location or uh, whatever, and build on that to utilize social media, as I mentioned, for socioeconomic development. Thank you. I think that social media and, me and uh, social networks are going to continue to evolve uh, more or less as they have uh, been evolving and they're going to remain a communication tool but we need to see how we're going to integrate them into our everyday lives uh, for instance in education 
and I would just like to give you an example uh, that a teacher told me about uh, in a conversation. She said, look, I've got a, um, a distance learning training and I've got some classes that I want to put online, but very often my students don't go to that platform uh, to get the documents and to download the documents. But if I put the link immediately on my Facebook page, then everyone knows about it immediately and people start talking about it immediately. So I think we need to think about how we use these social networks to develop edu educational and other act activities. But uh, above all, it remains a communication tool. Thank you. Um, I think we're at the beginning of uh, a new era and we will see uh, new kinds of governments emerge. Uh, and I was inspired by the story in, in the book, uh, Here Comes Everybody, where, mm -hmm. you know, those guys that come from nowhere build uh, a school in Africa and then disappear. Mm -hmm. And I think this is very important because probably the new kind of governance will be about gathering people around ideas and not around personalities or not around identities. And this is crucial because sometimes identities, local identities, the difference between us is something that is uh, very uh, hindering for the discussions and for the safety of everybody. So I conclude by saying uh, don't fear the future. So I think it will be a good future for everybody. So a couple of words, just, just in, term, in summary, and I, I think it's just based on more on these questions that, that we've had. Um, clearly, the internet is still relatively young. Um, when you look at uh, how long it's been around in, in conjunction with other technologies, very, very young. But however, it has advanced faster than any technology we've ever seen. In fact, we're having trouble keeping up with it because we're having conversations now about things like security and things like what do I tell my children and all of those things that, that take it out of the realm of technology and into the, 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 the world of, of culture. It's a part of our culture now. Um, and as Paco said, probably maybe not even five years from now, maybe two years from now, we won't be having a conversation about the internet, just like we don't have conversations about water or breathing or all of those things that are a daily part of our life. Um, so I'm looking forward to that time when it comes. So um, first, join me in thanking all of my colleagues here for a wonderful discussion. And I'll have us thank the people who joined us online <laughs> and stuck with us through that. And I think Ted has a few closing comments. Well, as long as we're thanking people, I'd like to thank our moderator, Reggie Henry, for some inspiring words of his own. Thanks very much. Uh, I have to tell you that there is something here that does scare me. And uh, Paco was the one who said it first. He said that the Internet's just a utility. The Internet, in fact, is like electricity or water already to the people who are growing up with the Internet. And one of the things that I want to make sure that we do is somehow make sure that we don't take that utility for granted. There are those of us who, shamefully it is, as it is, takes, take electricity and water for granted, although I know many in this room do not. And part of what we at the Internet Society want to be sure is that nobody takes the Internet for granted. The model that we have now is significant, uh, and the fact is that it has been the greatest engine for innovation, both social and economic, that I think anybody of this generation and maybe the last three generations has seen. And what we want to do is protect and preserve that model. And in order to do that, we cannot take it for granted. So one of our challenges is how do we make sure that that sensibility is instilled in our young people? And we come back to the, uh, the gentleman's uh, phrase, education, education, and education, which I think was also echoed here a number of times. Um, I don't fear the future, uh, and I don't think any of us should. I think the future is remarkable ahead of us. Uh, and I also think that social networking has just begun to really enter the fabric of our lives. 
we're going to see so many different things that are coming about because of social media and social networking. And, and I want to participate in all of them. And I want my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, to be teaching me how exactly we're going to do that. So I want to thank all of you so much for being here today. Please carry on these conversations as you go on. Continue to network here and enjoy this wonderful global INET. I hope to see you all at the gala dinner this evening. Thank you all very much. Thanks, buddy. It's fascinating. Yeah, I think I just started. I want to keep these conversations. I know.